The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. It's springtime, although some days it's still a bit chilly, but those nice warm spring and summer days are coming. And we want you to be physically ready and not overdo it early and knock you out of action. So we've invited our good friend and aging partner's personal trainer, Tracy Foreman, to come by and make sure we are getting our bodies ready for gardening, walking, bicycling, or any other kind of activity as we start spending more time outdoors. Don't go away. Don't you love organizations with heart? I'm Kristen Stowes, and I am so pleased to have as my guest today, the new executive director of the Seniors Foundation, Gina Cotton. Please stay tuned to hear about the future of this wonderful organization. I'm Lita Powell Drake, and today we're going to visit the magnificent, beautiful American Speedway. <laughs> oh, they have the most beautiful cars over there. Please stay tuned. There's a lot of information involved in your estate. We'll discuss guidelines on how to prepare a notebook for those who are administering your estate after you pass away. Stay tuned for some very helpful recommendations. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. It has been a long winter. At least it feels like a long winter to me. And adding in some isolation with COVID-19, many of us have probably not been exercising and stretching like we should. And before we just jump into some of those outdoor activities, it's a good idea to make sure we are ready. So to help us out, Joining us today is Tracy Foreman, Aging Partners personal trainer and community health educator to show us the right way to get started and talk about some of the Aging Partners fitness classes that will be happening on Zoom. Tracy, welcome. Thank you, Jerry. Nice to be here. Why should um, we think about getting ourselves prepared even for something that perhaps seems as simple as gardening or just taking a little walk? Well, I think people have a tendency to think that they can just jump right back into where they were when they first started exercising. But if they've been sedentary for some time, like many of us have been throughout this year, then it is harder to get back into our regular exercise routine. So getting started slowly is always the best, op best option and realizing you may not be in the same shape that you were a year ago. So starting right. slowly is good. And we're going to give a little bit of a demonstration a little bit later on. So, um, but it, but it it really is important and, and and very valuable. Now, there are some other options out there if uh, people would like to 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 get back into shape uh, for the spring and for the summer. And one of those is the classes that Aging Partners offers on Zoom. Let's talk a little bit about some of those classes and and how, what's that process like. Well, I'll say, Jerry, that Zoom is here to stay. And so it, we can take advantage of those classes in our homes. And we have several op different types of opportunities available through Zoom. We have the Qigong classes that uh, many people are really getting on board with. And those are available a couple of times a week on Zoom. We also have dance classes if you're more into the cardio part of it. And our dance classes combine not just the cardio, but also strength, flexibility, and balance. We also have the yoga classes that are available. Joy is the instructor for those classes, and she does a great job. We have Tai Chi classes available at two different levels. There's the beginning Tai Chi, and that goes through eight forms of Tai Chi, and then it takes you on to level two Tai Chi. So you can get on board with that also. And oftentimes we'll just have uh, flexibility classes or, or uh, just getting fit with weights classes. So it's always good to tune into the Aging Partners programs. Yeah, it's great stuff. Uh, I take advantage of it. Uh, there are people out there who, who, who aren't comfortable with the Zoom um, part of that, um, we should also mention uh, just quickly that uh, there are some other ways to, to get some of these fitness classes and you can put them on your big screen TV, uh, you can go through YouTube, you can go through Hulu, um, and there are some other options. Um, you and I have a video out there of trying to train people into the 24 form uh, Tai Chi if anybody wants to, uh, to, take a, to take a look at that. So that's another option, right? 
Yeah, they can certainly go on and look at some of the YouTube videos that we have available. LNK TV has daily programs from starting early in the morning and going every half an hour uh, throughout a lot of uh, the morning hours and then some into the evening hours also. So accessing that way if you have cable TV. But on YouTube, if they just go to the Aging Partners, Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, if you just type that in and then type in fitness and it'll bring all kinds of things up, including yours and my program, <laughs> Jerry. So if you want to learn how to do 24 form Tai Chi. Great. Uh, one more thing before we get into our little demonstration. Let's talk about the fit lot. This is something that's pretty new and a, and a way to uh, exercise outside. Fit lot is located at 33rd and O Street in Lincoln, right in the Woods Park location there. It's an outdoor fitness area that really promotes circuit training, but they're going to be having classes starting up pretty soon, uh, early, uh, late spring, early summer. And so I encourage you to call Parks and Rec if you're interested. There's cardio equipment, there's strength equipment, there's equipment that helps you to work on balance, and there will be trainers available to work there. So it's going to be a fun project. And we are actually in partnership with Parks and Rec and AARP right now. Very good. All sounds great. Okay, enough talking about exercise and stretching. Let's uh, use uh, Bo's magic uh, and transform us into your studio and we'll give people a good demonstration of some easy stretching and a few exercises. All right, so through again the magic of uh, Bo and Jamie, we have uh, moved out of our where we were zooming and now we're here. Uh, in the exercise room at uh, Aging Partners, or uh, Tracy's Lair, as we like to call it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So what we want to do is to, uh, to give you some examples um, of some things we have been talking about, and again, sort of reiterate why these things are important. Um, so we're going to start uh, in a real basic, simple fashion and do a few sitting in the chair. I, uh, I know there are people out there who go, oh, chair, you can't get any exercise in a chair. And uh, I have learned from experience that, um, that being in the chair is, is a great place to start. It gets you warmed up. Um, it gets you some nice stretching. So, um, and, and that's really one of the keys, as we talked about earlier, um, if you've been pretty sedentary over the course of the winter, haven't been doing some of these things before you get out to work on your garden or you want to ride a bike or you want to start walking again, it's a good idea to get some stretching done and you can do it in the chairs. Yeah, and I encourage people to start every single morning with stretching and you can do that even in bed before you get up. Absolutely. So. I, I started that after you told me that and I'd say it's a great idea <laughs> and I think it's real helpful. Okay, so uh, let's start in the chairs. Um, we're going to uh, take you through um, some real uh, basic kinds of stretching exercises and these are also some of the things that happen in the classes uh, that, we, that we have the fitness classes so correct first and foremost you want a nice solid chair you don't want to sit on a rolling chair or the no. couch or a recliner right. so we want to be able to sit so our back is straight you don't want your back against the back of the chair move to the center or toward the front of the chair Feet are flat and wide and you're relaxed. So let's just do that first with our breath. Always bringing the breath in, breathing from the lower abdomen up through the diaphragm and into the chest. So let's bring our arms down at our sides and just do a forward lift with our arms. Inhale. We're regulating our breath right now and exhale. Just let those arms float down. So feeling the relaxation occurring in your body. We don't want to lock our joints. Inhale back up through your nose. We're inhaling and exhaling through your nose. Exhale down. Again, inhale up. And exhale down. And let's just rest our hands now on our knees as we move into a, a look over our shoulder here. We're going to be doing a just a little spinal twist when we look over that shoulder and then we'll go to the other side nice and easy look over the other shoulder bring it across look over 
And one more time, keep your breath moving. You never want to hold your breath throughout these movements or these stretches here. And bring it back. And let's just drop our chin down to our chest. And then we'll bring our arms down to our sides here. So let's bring one arm across and touch the outside of the opposite knee. And with a big inhale, now we're going to push against that knee and inhale into a big twist here. Pushing, you can reach back and grab the chair, or you can just drop your arm at the side here. But it helps to deepen that stretch a little bit. And then bring it back to the center on an exhale. Do it on the other side. Inhale, push. Look over that shoulder. And exhale, bring it back to front. Let's do it one more time, and then we'll go into one more from a seated position. And bring it back on the exhale to the center, and inhale to the other side. Look over. If you hear any cracks, that's not uncommon when you're doing spinal stretches and come back to no, the center. No, that's probably me. That, that could have been me, too. So I like this stretch here because I think if you have a lot of tension in your back, circling at the torso is really a great one to get into all those stiff points in your lower back and in your hip. So we're doing a big uh, torso circle here, getting your core muscles working and warmed up. Just reach the crown of the head out in front. And then as you come back, don't touch the back of the chair, but engage those abdominals. So you need to be right in the center of your chair and keep that breath moving. And then let's go. We always switch up and go the other way. Do you like this one, Jerry? I do. I like this one a lot. And I've yeah. got one more in the chair that I, I'd like to suggest that we yes. try real quick too, if we have time. Yes, let's go ahead. We'll do one more circle here and then come up and let's do your stretch, Jerry. I just like, um, I had to have foot surgery um, a few years back. And uh, I just think any of those where you are stretching and, um, yes. and pulling up just a little bit um, is, is really a good one for me. And, and I like it sitting in the chair doing that too. Good for everyone to stretch into their hamstrings. And if you have arch issues in your feet or if you have uh, muscle issues in your legs at all, these are great ones. So I agree with you. We'll rest our elbow on our knee and toe points up at the ceiling. That's key because that really brings that hamstring into play here. And that's what we want to do in the calf also. So head up as you reach out toward that foot. And let's do a big breath here. And then exhale and lower your head down. Now you feel that stretch deepening. <laughs> and then we just very easily round up. So you don't want to bounce into a stretch, even though we see people doing that. It's never a good idea to do that. So let's go ahead and bring the other leg out. Heel down, toe points at the ceiling. Lean forward and try to keep your head up at this point. And then we'll do our big breath here. Inhale. And exhale, drop your head down. I'm even feeling that one this morning in my back. Yeah. So that's a good one. And then round up. So a couple of other good ones you can do with the leg, legs and feet is to just do a heel and toe. So stretching into the arch, that's a, a point and flex. And do that on both sides a few times. And yeah. So those are good. And just even. Uh, on your on your toe, I, I I like this one as well, and it's it's especially good. It just gets you warmed up and gets it it loosens up those muscles a little bit. In our stretching practices or our qigong or tai chi or any of those, we really get into our ankles, our feet, and our legs a lot. Yeah, so warming those ankles up is a great idea. So okay, oh, okay, let's stand up. We got a couple of minutes left here uh, to uh, talk about some things. One of the things that we wanted to wanted to show you, for those of you who perhaps are not as familiar with some of the classes, uh, we did talk about some of the, the classes that are, that, are, that are coming up and that are on, on Zoom. We also talked about uh, some, some programs that you can uh, get on demand. And yeah. so these are a couple of the exercises and things that you might see uh, on those programs. Yes. In our Qigong practice, we tell people to 
make sure your joints are never locked. So we'll spread our feet. And this is just a great stretch that you can do. And we're regulating our breath here. So softening our knees and then pulling our hands up, inhaling up toward our chest, and then turning our palms down and exhaling, softening your knees as you come down. You notice we're doing the nasal breath. Inhale. Exhale. And you can just feel yourself relaxing when you do this one. Inhale, bring it up. And exhale down. There are many levels of stretches that we do in our practices. One of them that we're going to do next is called Pluck the Orchid. I like this one, I know Jerry does too, because it not only works on weight distribution, but it also is a good stretch for your legs and a practice of, of keeping your, your core over your hips or your torso over. So we're gonna reach, stretching into our shoulder here. Imagine you're plucking that orchid and pulling across. Head follows the movement of the arms. So let's incorporate our breath. Inhale as we reach. Exhale as you pull across and release. These stretching practices help us to learn to regulate our breath a little differently too. Instead of the shallow breath, we're doing the deep abdominal breath here. And then this time when we reach across, we'll do one more on this side, inhaling, and then exhaling as we pull back, and then let's just switch with the other arm. Feel the shoulder work here also. In our classes, we always have some nice soothing music playing, and that helps a lot too. Very nice. There you go. That's a nice one. So we step back in. As always, mm -hmm. our time is way too short. It is and way too short. Yes. Thank you so much for, for stopping by uh, and giving us a, a nice yeah. demonstration. Um, thank all of you uh, for tuning in today. We appreciate it. We want you to stay safe, stay healthy, and stay fit. And as always, it's never too late to live and learn. Vulnerable and senior adults might be living in silent fear of elder abuse and financial exploitation. We can do something about it. The Nebraska DHHS recommends that communities maintain and improve resources such as public transportation and senior centers to prevent social isolation. Engage professionals in various disciplines to find solutions to end elder abuse. Every year, June 15 is observed as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, an opportunity to ensure justice for all. The Seniors Foundation is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. While much has been accomplished up to this point, there are new plans ahead. I am thrilled to have its new executive director on our show today, Gina Cotton. Gina, welcome to Live and Learn. Thank you, Chris, for having me today. It's wonderful to have you here. I know that you are quite new to the Seniors Foundation, but not to the nonprofit community. Could you please fill us in a little on your background and why this position is a particularly good fit for you? Well, first of all, this is my favorite population, so I'm super happy to be here today. But fundraising is doesn't uh, is definitely in my in my forte. I was with the American Heart Association for years. I did the Heart Walk and the Go Red for Women campaign and the Gala, the Heart Ball, known to many. And again, a, a something near and dear to my heart. My father was a sufferer of heart disease, so that was a, an easy fit for me. Then I went from there to KLKN TV Channel 8. Who would have thought that transition would happen? But marketing and uh, ha watching out for people's best interest has always been a desire of mine. And getting to know the community, who the movers and shakers are is always fun. And then I did some time at Tabitha in development. So. I got to really, really expand on my love for our senior population in that role. And so now here I am at the Seniors Foundation supporting everything seniors, and I couldn't be happier. This position really does combine all of your expertise in one position, doesn't it? 
Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. It it's, sure perfect. Does. it's a perfect fit. Well, yes. this is a big year for the foundation. It's the 40th anniversary. What is the mission of the Seniors Foundation? We really are here to do everything aging partners. So we support them anything, they, they're fantastic. They are everything seniors and we are everything to support them. So my goal, my personal goal is to never say no. If, if Randy comes to say, Gina, we need to do this. We, for example, COVID happened and it, it put things in their plate that they weren't expecting, didn't budget for but they needed some financial support. So that's what they come to the Seniors Foundation and say, we need some help. So we are here for everything Aging Partners. That's fabulous, that's fabulous. And what a wonderful, wonderful projects to, to support. Absolutely. Your board members then are really key in establishing this mission. Could you please tell us about your board of directors? Yes. Oh my gosh. I, and I know no offense to any other board I've ever served on, but this board, as you well know, is fantastic. They serve, they give their time, talent, and treasure, which is amazing. Our current president is Christine Dykeman Schoening, who I worked for previous, worked with previously, and she is fantastic. And wow, this is a board. She keeps us on task. We are moving and shaking and doing all wonderful things. Love her. She's got great expertise in senior care, knows that population. Our incoming president is Denise Booling, who's got great grant writing skills. So I'm a little excited to have her on board because yes. that'll allow us to export some, explore some new opportunities in the grant field to, again, keep supporting aging partners in any way we can but it is the best board I think I've ever served with. So thrilled to have them all. Well, they're always very active, very engaged. And what I appreciated about it, everybody's always on the same page, working for the same goal and just gets along and puts everybody's skills and expertise together and it works. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, Couldn't be happier with I all. I agree, it's a fabulous board. Yep. Well, over the years, this board really has addressed so many needs of the seniors community, such as the downtown active age centers, the senior transportation in various and sundry forms, um, snow removal assistance, this new program, this neighbor link that is getting so much buzz. Yep. And I think it's a fabulous program. Um, I guess I feel, and, and do you agree, this is the beauty of the mission of the Seniors Foundation Board is that it changes with the times and it addresses the current needs. Absolutely. It has to be agile. And I mean, COVID is the greatest example to say out of the blue, it changed everything. And for that, for the senior population, connectivity is so important. And now they can't go to the Seniors Foundation for lunch lunch has to be brought to them now they don't have that 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 connection with their friends and, and isolation sets in mm -hmm. so neighborly you mentioned neighborly that program started because of covid and now it could be our our current mayor is a part of the program so we're thrilled with that it's a matter of maybe it's a phone call how are you doing just checking in with you to maybe do you need a ride to your doctor's appointment or here, let us deliver the meal to your home. What a great program, and that's gonna continue. So that was a, one of those things that didn't exist before COVID, it's now in place and it's going to continue. So I am thrilled with that program. It's a great way to take care of our neighbors, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. It's, 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 it was um, formed from a need and it's going to continue. And absolutely. I, what, what more? Can you say than that? Yeah. Uh, we're gonna throw in something just kind of funny since we're talking about anniversary celebrations. During my board tenure, tenure, we had the 25th anniversary celebration and we were able to bring in Art Linkletter. <laughs> yeah. So we have a picture of Art Linkletter and Midge Irvin, who was a board member at that time and myself. Very fun way to have a gala celebration. I'm just wondering if there might be stars in your future, Gina. Well, who knows? You just <laughs> never know. Well, we need to get you back on the board and have you get that going for us. There I we mean, go. your, your time, what you did for the Seniors Foundation was fantastic. And I, I'm sure your ears buzz daily because you are talked about daily because of what you have done for the Seniors Foundation. Well, it, it's always a labor of love for seniors for me, too. So I, I agree with that. Well, 
the Seniors Foundation has felt that it's always been important to honor those who have given back to the seniors community in big ways and small through the Community Service Awards and then through the Keystone Award. Um, let's start talking about a few of the individuals that we have honored over the years. Um, let's see, we'll start with the Community Service Award in 2005, Helen Busalis. Gina, take, say a couple of things about Helen. Well, Lincoln's first female mayor. Let's, let's uh, first start with that, right? right? What a great gal. Let me just say, uh, ball of fire and how fortunate we were to have her amongst us and doing what she did. What a pioneer. Uh, I, I just can't, can't say enough about her. Fantastic, yes, yes. fantastic deserving, leader in our community. Very deserving first award winner there. And she's pictured here with Bill Luxford, who was a, a gem of a person too at, at the uh, TV studio. All right, then in 2006, Gil Savory became the Community Service Award winner, longest serving news editor in the Lincoln Journal paper's history. Yep. 2007, Leela Shanks, advocate for change, civil rights, social justice. You, you, you can't say enough about Leela Shanks. Right. She was an amazing individual. And then in 2008, Jerry Joyce, and he is often recognized for his work in the legacy retirement communities to af provide affordable yet elegant living. So those three are pictured in this uh, photo along with June Peterson and myself. Yep. Wonderful, wonderful individuals. Yep. So then at that point, we changed gears a little bit into the Keystone Award. And in 2011, Joe Hampton. Joe, oh my gosh. I mean, we, we Joe needs no, no introduction. <laughs> I mean, his name is everywhere still in the community. What another pioneer. He started Lima, for example. I mean, what a personality and what a go-getter. And you talk about if you wanted to get do things done, you called Joe. <laughs> Joe, right? Joe, Joe got things done. A 12-year member of the council. I mean, I, I can't say enough wonderful things about Joe Hampton. But yeah. again, we are so fortunate to have had him in our community. Yes, so many people that are so de de deserving of awards. Yeah. 2012, Harlan Johnson, longtime volunteer of the Red Cross and the Cornhusker State Games, and he was also a, a Live and Learn host. That's how I got to know him. 2013, Scott Young. Scott Young, <laughs> right? Icon, can I say icon in our community? Uh -huh, yes. Well, he's 10 feet tall, so you can't <laughs> miss him. <laughs> he's got that great radio voice, but of course known for the food bank and what he's done for uh, the hungry in our community. When I was in Leadership Lincoln, I had the opportunity to tour the food bank and we, pulled our group aside and we decided that that is a group that we needed to help that backpack program. Can't say again, enough things about Scott Young. He, what a great guy. What That's a great exactly guy right. for our community. That's exactly right. So followed up then by David Wilcox, community leader and philanthropist in services benefiting senior, seniors. He was a retired trust officer, of course, for Union Bank and Trust. Dell Williamson of Groundwater Foundation fame. Then Dorothy Appleby, just a couple words on Dorothy, but doesn't everybody know and love Dorothy? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, the pianist, at least chicken, let's not let's not leave that, or the organist. Yes. What a great gal. Feisty, fireball, fantastic, right? Absolutely, totally agree with that. 2018, then we had Colleen Sang, another past mayor of Lincoln. So those two are pictured then with Dale Williamson and Dave Wilcox at a different Keystone event. Yeah. yeah. And then our very last award winner was David Rusk. Talk about yeah. David a minute. Oh my God. So I just got to know David. So we're partnering with the Veterans Freedom Music Festival on an event we're having on June 13th. And he is delightful. Again, what I hear about David is if you want something done, you call David Rusk. So I thought, okay, good, good guy to know. And that is the truth. Delightful, a thrill to be working alongside with him. Yes, yes. And I totally agree with that. He is an energizer bunny in my mind. Agreed. <laughs> David. So, well, unfortunately, Gina, the Keystone event has had to be canceled for a couple of years because of the pandemic. Are you planning to bring that back? 
We are, uh, and let, let's not forget who introduced Keystone event to the Seniors Foundation, <laughs> Mrs. Stowe's. Yeah, uh, thr thrilled to have that. We're hoping, let's keep our fingers crossed, that we can bring it back in the fall. Yeah. That is something that has been canceled for the last two years. And for the Seniors Foundation, that has served as a, a major fundraising e event for mm -hmm. us. So we've definitely missed that. We do have an opportunity for a Flag Day event that we're having Okay, Gina, yes, let's put up uh, the uh, flyer for that. And we have just about a minute left. So if you could please fill us in on this wonderful event in June. So if you're old enough to remember the Christmas lights at Mahoney State, not Mahoney State Park, but the park where you drive through and the, you have your radio on and the music lights would come on, we're having a similar event. We're having a drive-through event on June 13th and it will talk about Victory Park and the changes that are happening there. We're partnering with the Veterans Music Freedom Festival, so there will be music. You can tune into your car, COVID friendly, stay in your vehicle drive through the campus, learn about aging partners, and honor our veterans at the same time. That is absolutely perfect, perfect way to introduce people to the VA campus, lovely grounds. It'll be summer and we'll be outside. Looking forward to it, Gina. That sounds yeah. like a great, great event. You bet. Gina, as we wrap up here, what does it mean to you personally to be involved in this manner with the senior population at Lincoln? Well, I love this population. I wish everybody, I've always had an affinity for seniors. They're just, their insight there, they're just so wise. And I wish the world would slow down for just a little bit to listen and learn, which I'm like, I actually thought it might, that's the name of your program, but it's the truth. It is the truth. They have so much to offer. And if we just pause for a minute and listen, there's so much we can learn from them, and I am thrilled to do anything to help that population lead a better life. So, oh, perfectly said, Gina. Perfectly said. Thank you so much for your expertise and your commitment to the Seniors Foundation. I have always thought that it is a board with its heart in the right place. So, what a perfect leader for the board. <laughs> thank you, Chris. Gina Cotton, thank you so much for being with us today, and to all of you. Thank you for continuing to live and learn. Hi, I'm Randy Jones with Aging Partners. Did you know that Lincoln expects a 75% increase in the number of seniors living in our community over the next 15 years? Aging Partners is a community service that provides fitness programs to help keep older adults strong and healthy. This year, Lincoln Cares donations are providing funds for new fitness equipment. You can help make this happen. Sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Lita Powell Drake and we have a special guest today because we're going to the Museum of American Speed right here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Welcome, Tim Matthews. Oh, you've got such a beautiful place in which to work. Uh, well, when did the museum first open? You know, you could date the museum back all the way to 1952 when, when Bill Smith started his business right here in Lincoln, his speed parts business. Uh, but we became a 501c3 nonprofit museum in 2002. Uh, and that's uh, the, when we opened up the, the museum here in the large building where we're at now. It's 150,000 square feet, three stories tall, and not too far from downtown Lincoln. You just on the corner. You just around the corner. <laughs> That's oh, right. Well, let's take a look at some of these beautiful cars. You will not believe them. And Hedy Lamar. I mean, if you remember here, she had a 1958 Cadillac. It belonged to her. Hedy Lamar. Tell us about that. Oh. What an amazing woman. Very similar to you, Lita, I'll be honest. Uh, somebody that has this uh, amazing history. Uh, Hedy Lamarr was a, an, an American actress. She was actually uh, born, an Austrian-born uh, woman, 1914, but she moved to America to uh, further her acting career. And just an amazing lady. Not only was she kind of dubbed one of the most beautiful women in Hollywood, she uh, uh, did a lot of amazing movies. Some of your viewers may remember, you know, Ecstasy, Algiers, uh, Samson and Delilah, you know, all these wonderful films. Uh, and this was her personal car, this 1958 Cadillac. She loved it so much, uh, she ended up giving it to her gardener, uh, it, who drove it for many years before it uh, came to the museum here. And it's one of our prized possessions. Well, and I understand she was brilliant. She was a brilliant woman. Not only an actress, but an inventor too. She, yeah, uh, you know, when yeah. you, 
when you look at your cell phone, some of the Wi-Fi technology in your cell phone was actually invented by her. She actually uh, uh, was into uh, uh, this uh, theory of frequency hopping uh, that she used for uh, guiding American torpedoes uh, during World War II that she ended up selling to the Navy. Uh, if you want to do some research on somebody that's just amazing, Hedy Lamar is, is that person, just a, just a great gal. All right, well, let's take a look at the 1948 Tucker, the Tucker. <laughs> Boy, I understand that this is worth a few million dollars. Oh, yeah. This uh, car behind me, it's actually the one I'm sitting in front of now. It's, it's one of our prized possessions. And, uh, you know, our founder, Bill Smith, purchased it many years ago. Uh, they only built 51 Tucker torpedoes. And, and this is one of them. This is number 47. It's painted in waltz blue, which just happens to be Preston Tucker's wife's uh, favorite color. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the reason the Tucker became so popular, uh, you know, it, it was a car that was well ahead of its time, uh, a vehicle that had a lot of really wonderful safety uh, inventions. It was the first car with safety glass. Uh, it had a center headlight that would turn with the front wheels so you, it would kind of guide you around your corners. Uh, it was a rear engine car uh, and it even had this funky uh, crash compartment. Uh, if you knew you were going to get in an accident, you would tuck down and hide underneath this padded dash and supposedly that was going to keep you safe. Also the first, one of the first cars with factory seat belts. So I mean, it's a pretty oh. cool car. Oh. And the seatbelt is so very, very important. Another amazing car is the 1957 Thunderbird. Yeah, oh, mate. Lita, you'd look good driving this car and, and being. <laughs> yeah, be, but this know, one goes. This one can go 200 miles an hour or something, isn't it? Yeah, so this 57 T-Bird, we're so fortunate. It was just recently donated to the Museum of American Speed uh, by a wonderful man named Joe Walden. And Joe uh, lives in uh, Burbank, California. He's owned this car since it was new. Uh, his dad had to co-sign for him when he was young to, to purchase it. Uh, and Joe was a welder and he became well known for his welding abilities and a lot of race car people started going to him to, to get his help on racing cars and they talked him into taking his T-Bird out to the Bonneville Salt Flats and uh, so he did some work uh, to the engine. He, he put a 427 engine out of one of Bobby Unzer's Pike's Peak cars and in 1964 took it out and became the fastest street driven car, the only street driven, driven car to exceed 200 miles per hour. And uh, the car's never been repainted. It's just in spectacular shape and one of our most prized displays here at the museum. All of the cars look like they're brand new. <laughs> it's Boy. amazing. <laughs> but 200 miles an hour at Bonneville, think about driving a car like that. 200 uh, uh, miles an hour at Bonneville. I'm not brave enough. The older I get, oh. 200 sounds more and more scary. But, uh, you know, it, I can't imagine the thrill it would have been to, to do that and then uh, to get become uh, so well known for it. He was, uh, you know, written about in many magazines of the time. And, and uh, so uh, it's a very well known car, believe it or not. And any, like you mentioned, any Thunderbird is really neat. But to have one that's uh, become historic for what it accomplished at Bonneville is pretty cool. And there's a man named Joe Valden, and uh, he actually donated, I believe, I understand that, uh, donated the, the Thunderbird, and that's at the museum now? It sure is. And, you know, uh, that's... A, it it's a good opportunity to talk a little bit about that because a lot of the vehicles that we have here at the museum, you know, were a part of the original collection by Bill and Joyce Smith. Mm -hmm. And we're always adding to the collection, but there are a lot of donations that come in. We're so fortunate uh, being a nonprofit that, uh, you know, we get cars in that way. We also have a wonderful volunteer program here at the museum where people donate their time. We have over 50 volunteers and you don't have to be a gearhead to become one of our volunteers. So if any of your viewers are interested in a place to come uh, and help out, boy, we're always looking for new uh, friends. Oh, that would be so much fun. <laughs> Just show those beautiful cars. Everybody come in. Oh, golly. <laughs> All right, now, what is the green monster? I got to figure that one out. So the Green Monster came to our museum just recently during the height of the COVID pandemic. Uh, we were, it was donated to us by the Peterson Museum in California. And it's a big jet powered uh, Bonneville racer 
that was built by a man named Art Arfons, uh, who some of your viewers may recognize that name. He was very uh, involved in land speed racing in the 60s and 70s. This particular style car uh, went over 600 miles per hour. I mean, it oh. was just an amazing, uh, just an amazing piece of work. And Art Arfons was very well known because he wasn't a high budget guy. He'd piece his cars together out of whatever he could find. And the engine was army surplus. So he was able to find this big jet. And nowadays you'd have it it'd be impossible to do these sorts of things. But uh, back then you could just find these parts laying around and he built this amazing car out of them. Well, what is extraordinary about that place is the, the cars are all so fresh and perfect, like they have never been driven. <laughs> how, do you, how do you keep them up? Well, it's a, it's a labor of love and you know, we're so lucky. We have such a passionate staff and I'll, I'll mention our passionate volunteers again. They, they want everything to be in tip top condition. Most of the cars are very well restored and beautiful like the Tucker behind me. It, you know, it looks like it just came off a showroom floor, but there are a lot of cars that we love finding that are kind of preserved in their natural state. They're kind of what we'd call barn finds. Uh, and we try to leave them that way with all their original marks and dust and so we try to have a combination of both. Again, what is the Hot Rod Roaster? What is that? Sure, we have a couple of cars. Uh, there's one car in particular that uh, I remember when you were here recently, we talked about a car named the Outlaw, which was a really neat car. Uh, it was built by Ed uh, Big Daddy Roth, and this was in the 60s when custom car building uh, became such a national phenomenon. You know, you look back to the 1960s and, and cars in general were just such a part of our culture. And, uh, you know, Ed Big Daddy Roth became very well known to young people for his crazy monster cartoons. And he was more of an artist uh, than a car builder. And he'd create these crazy cars that would go out on the show circuit and get a lot of attention. Then they would end up being model kits so kids could build these models at home. And even this particular car became a Hot Wheel. So, uh, you know, it's fun to see people come to the museum and see these cars and say, wow, I had the Hot Wheel of that car. I built that model kit as a kid. And we have a few cars in the collection like that. Was that the Itsky Roadster? The next car that we'll talk about is the Itsky Roadster. And a and lot of people ask me what... Name. Well, you know, it's, it's named after the man who built it. And the cool thing about the Ed Iskandarian Roadster, it looks kind of barn fresh. It doesn't have a shiny paint job and the interior's uh, a little bit ratty. Uh, and the neat people ask me about it all the time. And I say, you know, the Ed Iskandarian Roadster is kind of like if this place were a pamphlet full of baseball cards, this would be the Babe Ruth rookie card because it's one of the original hot rods. This thing was built in 1937. It, uh, it's, it's been completely uh, intact the way it was built way back then. Ed Iskandarian incidentally would go on uh, to really create uh, the hot rod world that you know became a phenomenon and a, and a big, uh, uh, industry. Uh, he started building camshafts for vehicles uh, for guys that were racing and building hot rods and, and uh, became a, a household name, you know. So having his original car here is pretty special. I have to tell you a story that, that you didn't know because I shouldn't have done this. When you first opened up, I was, I ran over there. <laughs> I ran over there to see what was, and I saw Hedy Lamar's car and nobody was around. So I went and sat in it and put my hands on the steering wheel and so forth. And somebody <laughs> came over and says, you can't do that. You can't do that. <laughs> I said, my clothes are clean. You know, I got into her car. I should not have done that. You don't not supposed to do that. <laughs> well, you know, Lita, we don't typically allow people to get in cars, but we might make an exception for you. You're pretty oh, no, no. special. <laughs> yeah. So if there's ever a day you need to sit in Hetty's car again, we hope you come out. I I'd give you that chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, the Museum of, of Modern Speed is really something very special. And let me tell you, and you might want to write this down quickly as to where they're located, at 599 Oak Street Drive, it's right off O Street. And you turn left, and I, as if you were going to the Sun Valley Bowling, which is, I, I go to the bowling, it's right across the street from the bowling alley there. And they're open from uh, uh, Monday, let's say Monday through Friday, so yeah, Mondays and Fridays, just for this month. Once we get into our summer hours, then we're open every single day uh, from noon to 4.30 and every Saturday from nine to one. And, and it's just a, it's a great place. There's something here for everybody. Well, it's never too late.
to live and learn about the Museum of American Speed. Thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful interview. Oh, my pleasure, Lita. It's really an honor. Vulnerable and senior adults might be living in silent fear of elder abuse and financial exploitation. We can do something about it. The Nebraska DHHS recommends that communities maintain and improve resources such as public transportation and senior centers to prevent social isolation. Engage professionals in various disciplines to find solutions to end elder abuse. Every year, June 15 is observed as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, an opportunity to ensure justice for all. Welcome to Live and Learn. Full and easy access to all the legal and financial information involved in your estate is necessary for the expedient and accurate administration of that estate. I'm Doug Jose, and joining me today is Lori Benson. And welcome, Lori, to Live and Learn. Thank you, Doug. It's my pleasure to be here. Lori, you've put together an estate administration uh, notebook. Uh, give us a, an overview of, of uh, that notebook and what's involved with it. Certainly. Um, the notebook is, and I literally do have a notebook here that I'll, I'll show you just in a little bit. Um, it's a, a collection of all the information that I believe would be helpful to my personal representative in the event that um, I would die and they would need to basically liquidate everything that I um, own. And liquidate includes convey. So it's a, a collection of personal and account information and property information and so forth. Um, I will say I do literally have a, a three ring binder and I don't know well how well it will show up, but I wanted something that I could use plastic sleeves to insert documents that I don't want a three hole punch. And I also wanted a place with a pocket so that I can put like my safe deposit box key and a flash drive. And then I've already got some notes for the update that I'm gonna be doing, uh, you know, once a year. Uh, so for the next update, I've got a few little notes here. So I actually do have a notebook, but anybody who does this should make it their own. What uh, motivated you to uh, put it in a neat format like this? Yeah, Doug, I started pulling together the information uh, for several reasons, and it's something I'd been meaning to do for several years. Um, I have served as the personal representative or executor of um, a couple of estates or helped with them as a family member. And so I've seen it from that side. Um, and also practicing law, I have seen it from the professional side. I practiced estate uh, administration and planning law. And so I've seen what can happen if you force your, your personal representative to go on a treasure hunt to find the information um, they need to administer your estate. And so uh, that can result in wasted time and wasted money. Um, and I, I wanted to make this easy for whoever my personal representative would be. And then I will add that this has turned out to be really useful for me right now um, because I finally got around to doing some things I'd meant to, you know, closing some accounts I don't use, cashing in a little life insurance uh -huh. policy, that sort of thing. So I'm reaping the benefits of a streamlined financial life. You've mentioned a couple of uh, terms here, and I think before we go on, we should discuss those. You said the personal representative and term executor. Uh, are they the same thing? And, and what's involved here in, in probate? Yes. Uh, so first of all, probate or a state administration, that's the same thing, um, And uh, essentially. And uh, the person who does that work is by Nebraska statute is called the personal representative, uh, so or PR. So that's the term we'll use. It's and the older term is executor, or uh, if a, a woman was doing it, uh, exec executrix was used sometimes. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. but the current term is personal representative. And here's the here's what the job of the personal representative at the most basic basic level. It is to collect the assets of the deceased, to pay any outstanding bills, and then to distribute whatever's left according to the will or possibly trust documents, or if there's no will, uh, according to state statute. So pretty, pretty straightforward, but it can be a lot of work. Okay, let's get into some of the details. Um, what about the, the personal information? How much of that should be included? Um, you know, here's what I think works, and this would dictate how much personal information and what to put in about your various accounts and so forth. Um, ask yourself, 
um, what would it take for somebody to liquidate everything in my life if I were gone? And liquidate could mean sell, it could mean give it away, it could you know, ben, uh, distribute according to will, whatever. What would it take? So what kind of account information, um, you know, the, the name of your financial institution and your account numbers and your safe deposit box number and where's the key and who has access to your box and uh, for your investment accounts, what's the account number and um, uh, who, how, who's a designated uh, beneficiary of, a, of your IRA? Just any kind of information like that for your personal property, um, where's the spare key for your car? Where's where's the uh, your car title? Um, all that kind of information, so that you are not forcing your personal representative to go on a treasure hunt uh, to find the information he or she needs. And you want to include usernames and passwords. Most of us have some sort of online life um, at this point in our lives. So just just walk through your life, take a look at whatever bills that you've paid. Say go back the last two years. Um, what have you paid? What gets charged to your credit card? That kind of information um, will get you a long ways toward um, having complete information. And, you know, this notebook is never going to be done. Um, as Within a couple of weeks of thinking I was finished uh, this last time, my last update, I'd already started making some notes for a couple of things that I'm going to have to change. So it's never done. Something's going to pop into your mind. You just add it. It'll be fine. Yeah, you made a list of contents, which we'll show portions of that as we go along here with our discussion and, and we'll review it at the end. So uh, that's uh, that information is available to the viewers as well. But let's talk a little bit more about those financial accounts. Uh, we have maybe uh, uh, a brokerage company. We have a bank uh, situation, uh, maybe other financial management firms. Um, what how, how I guess get into the depth here what how much detail should be included um, well I would suggest um, that you want to include uh, for example the name of the investment firm and who's your contact there if you've got somebody specific who's your uh, maybe you've got a financial ad advisor what are your account numbers what are what are the accounts are they IRAs or brokerage accounts or health savings account what is it um, are there designated beneficiaries and um, for those accounts? And then this is an example of something that had been on my list of things to do that I finally, I, I did this when I created my notebook. I wanted to know for any type of account I had, whether you're talking checking account or investment account or, or whatever, what would it take? What, what does that particular firm or bank or whatever, what do they want to see from a personal representative to get access to that account? And then I made notes of that in my notebook and said, well, you're going to have to show this or, you know, this is what's here's the form you're going to have to fill out or whatever. So I um, it made me feel better to know that I'd done everything I could to help my personal representative have access to those accounts. Um, usernames and passwords, again, um, it can be really, really helpful. So th that's the kind of information I would think about. What what would it take for them to access and liquidate that account? And then uh, there's more than financial accounts that may be that uh, other assets you want to include in a list somewhere in that book, maybe too. Oh, absolutely. And I should mention uh, safe deposit box. Um, you know, once again, um, that was something that I got around to doing, updating who has access to my safe deposit box. And, and I maintain a list of what's in my box. And, and, and again, personal representative would figure this out eventually, but I've made it easier by including a list of the contents in, in my notebook. And then there are other things too. As I said, you mentioned like my car, uh, I've got a list of some personal property that somebody might not realize has some value. Uh, you know, my, my, my 32 year old daughter who'd be the executor of my estate may not realize that, you know, this particular thing has some value. Uh, so, you know, I've tried to give her a heads up on that. So, uh, you know, any, any kind of information like that. What about uh, how you store this information? Uh, we talked about the notebook. Um, computers, thumb, have thumb drives. Um, what, what do you recommend here and who should have these? Uh, this is extremely important, Doug. This information is the keys to the kingdom finance, for your financial life. So you want to be very thoughtful about how you collect and store this information and with whom you share it. 
uh, I thought about this long and hard, finally decided I would create a Word document with the kind of information I talked about because it's so easy to update. All right. Uh, I store it. I do not store it on the hard drive of my internet connected laptop. It is stored on, and I work off a flash drive backed up to an external hard drive. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm very careful about, about that. Um, I have decided not to, I have shared with my, con, my personal representative and contingent personal representative, the fact that I've created this notebook and where it's located, the kind of information it includes. I've chosen not to burden them by sending them a copy because that would make them responsible for uh, the security of very, very sensitive information that they really have no use for right now. So be very careful about this. When you, when you put this uh, together, are, are there some items that you think people might overlook? I mean, we've mentioned a lot of things here and, and we've shown some of those on the screen, but are there some, uh, some things that might just sort of escape us? You know, the, the most common things, they, uh, this is based on my experience, and, and I've heard other lawyers say this, the, most, the, the things that get missed commonly when an estate is probated is an account that maybe isn't used much or hasn't been used in a while, maybe a, an insurance policy, and off-site storage can be a problem, particularly if you stored something uh, you know, where you're not paying for storage fees, maybe a friend is storing something for you. Uh, that's easy to miss those things. And the other thing that's easy to miss, uh, and this is, of course, more common these days, is things that maybe are uh, auto-charged to your credit card, say, once a year. Um, and again, your personal representative would figure it out eventually, but why not give them a heads up? And I know it's looking over the list here that uh, we we'll just review that again. Um, you have 17 uh, items. Uh, the last one you mentioned, though, was... Um, maybe funeral details is this if if those have been made that's probably very important to include in here as well um you, you know just recognize that if you if you've died that this information um by the time your executor or your personal representative looks at this it could be too late to use that information so health information information about pets funeral arrangements you maybe uh, that's maybe not going to be particularly useful okay. to uh -huh. your PR. But Doug, as you and I were talking about before we started uh, the taping, if you're incapacitated, that information could be really useful. So it doesn't hurt to include it. Just make sure you shared it otherwise. Yeah, there's there's some other things like um, maybe copies that are, these the notebook that I've. Uh, been working on for myself uh, things like copies of credit cards and birth certificates and passports and so on again um, it, it it brings it all together in one place I guess is the way I look at it and and uh, all those important documents as well yes you know one one other thing I'll add Doc, Doug is to include um, what your personal representative won't find so uh, for example um, they're going to want the last few years of your tax returns they're going to need those um, and for example, I had a, a, a tiny little life insurance policy my folks bought for me when I was a baby. So it showed insurance uh, or interest every year, um, but I cashed that in last year. So I made a note in the notebook that my personal representative does not need to go looking for that policy because it's not there anymore. So include what they won't find, such as documents that are stored online if you don't store things online. Laurie, this is uh, very good information. And want to thank you very much for bringing these insights to us and, and sharing your experience and assembling this all together. It's, uh, it's very important and, and uh, it makes it a lot easier for people who are going to administer our states uh, at some point down the road. So thanks a lot very, uh, very much for uh, bringing this to us. My pleasure, Doug. Thank you for having me. Remember, it's never too late to learn about the administration of your estate.